Okay, welcome back um, to all of the Art Appreciation students. This is actually the last set of videos. Um, if you're a little bit unsure as to why we're doing this last set of videos, these are a final review of some images. You may remember that uh, this past week we reviewed a number of the images that were on the study guide. Uh, just to give you a little bit of um, what things you might possibly say about each particular artwork. and. So we were not able to cover um, in this last week every single one. So I promised I would put the remaining ones up in a video or a series of videos. And so we have about 15 left to go out of the 40 that we had been talking about. And number 25 is this image right here, uh, painting by Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, it's an oil painting. And keep in mind that the primary purpose of what we're talking about is to give you some information that you can put along with your identification. So um, I'm going to concentrate mostly on some of the pretty obvious things rather than explain tons about each particular work of art. So number one, it is an oil painting. Number two, uh, it is an example of Renaissance art, of high Renaissance art. Um, it's also, like many of uh, Leonardo da Vinci's paintings, it's an example of sfumato. And um, we have also, we talked about this painting in terms of its triangular composition and use of implied lines directing you to certain areas of emphasis and focus. Another thing that we, um, when we looked at this painting, we often looked at it as a pair. We looked at both the one in the Louvre, this one, and the one at the British Museum. Um, because although I think that there's a lot about this composition and the figure drawing in this one that's a lot more graceful. I think that the other one can give us a little bit more of a clear sense of what his goals were in terms of color. Um, and let's see, is there anything else that I wanted to say? Uh, that's probably about it, so we'll move on to the next one. Um, and on this image, and I'm not going to give you all the, uh, the basic identification because it's right there. Um, on the study sheet and it's also right there um, in this slide you can see it right there but uh, let's see so first of all it's painting it's an example of fresco painting uh, if you remember fresco painting is painting directly into plaster um, where you paint while the plaster is still damp and it absorbs uh, the ink in fact in fresco painting the plaster itself is the binder for the pigment um, Another thing that you could definitely mention is it's also a high renaissance painting. Um, it's a great example of linear perspective, of one point perspective. Um, and uh, you know you can see uh, a very a renaissance type barrel vault. Um, and so there's that. Also, uh, then the other thing you could talk about if you wanted um, to kind of pick up a few more points on the test would be to talk about the content, which is that it is um, it's a painting of philosophers, that uh, it's, a, it's a painting of this whole history of Athenian philosophers, um, many of whom did not live at the same time, um, but they're all put into this one composition to kind of represent that, you know, one current of thought. Um, and also there is a self-portrait of Raphael in the painting as well. Okay, that's enough. That could get you some points on the test. All right, so this would be number 27 out of the study guide, which would be Titian's painting, Flame Marcius. Um, and remember, it's a Titian is a Renaissance painter. This is also an oil painting, um, although quite different from uh, Leonardo da Vinci's uh, way of painting an oil painting. And this is a late Titian, so really well into the period that we would call the Mannerist period. So Titian is a, a Renaissance artist, but um, he lived long enough that his, he was you know, productively working um, even in the, the period that we call the Mannerist period. Uh, what else would I say about this if I was taking a test on it? Um, well, you could talk about the story that, that literally is about a um, musical contest between uh, Marcius, the, uh, the fawn figure there, and Apollo. Apollo wins, and as part of his victory, he gets to uh, flay alive his opponent. It's pretty gruesome. 
and but it's a beautiful painting and it's um it's a kind of typical of late uh titian painting because there is so much uh kind of very quick virtuosic kind of brush mark um, very much the figures just kind of um, emerge out of the the mark making and also that there's just these layers and layers of color um, built over the different layers of, of mark making and and I think it kind of typifies why Titian was such an influential painter for the uh, for the Baroque period um, why people like Rubens or Velasquez so admired him um, and they are truly gorgeous surfaces, although you know, these late ones are a little bit odd, a little bit unusual, uh, but they are definitely beautiful. Okay, going back a little bit in time, uh, Jan van Eyck, uh, Arnolfini wedding portrait, um, also an oil painting, and um, let's see, we've talked about this one on a number of different occasions. Um, one, let's see, well, one we talked about when we were talking about the history of painting, uh, because we talked about in the Northern European Renaissance and the shift from painters who were painting um, entirely in tempera to then painters who were painting in tempera that was then kind of finished with varnishes of, of oil and oil color that was kind of, you know, oil varnish tinted with pigment, um, all the way up to the point of artists creating oil paint where they were grinding pigment directly into linseed oil and making an entirely new substance and Jan van Eyck definitely seems to be right there in the middle of it uh, we can't credit any one person as having you know invented oil painting and saying that person um, made that transition but Jan van Eyck was definitely um, living at the time and, and these this painting is, is clearly is an oil painting um, what else did I want to say about it? And so it's Northern European oil painting on panel. Um, and we also, there's a lot you can say about it in terms of the, the subject matter um, and who are the patrons and what they want from the painting. Um, but we um, never really had enough time in class to talk about that. But one thing we did talk about was talked about the, the color harmony system, uh, very much using a complementary color system of balancing the large amounts of green versus the large amounts of red. Um, and you can, we can also talk about it in terms of, and we did talk about it in terms of, it's a, you know, slightly based off of a axial reflective symmetry. It's not perfectly symmetrical by many, any means, but it's, you know, it has kind of a, a center axis to it. And then decisions on each side of the painting are thought of in opposition to the other side. Also, nice wooden shoes. That's just beautiful painting in there. Okay. Um, so, I can't remember what number this is. Probably 29. Um, the Ecstasy of St. Teresa. Uh, so, well, let's, th let's think about some of the things that we can talk about in this. First of all, it is a, it's sculpture. And it is a form of reductive sculpture it, because it is a stone carving, it's marble carving. Um, and so that fits into the, the reductive definition. It is um, also, you know, an example of Baroque art. Uh, Bernini was a Baroque artist. Um, another thing that we talked about was, we all, at a couple of times we compared this to um, the Ecstasy of St. Francis by Bellini. Um, and just talking about their different approaches um, to the idea of how to deal with um, the idea of rapture, the idea of, of someone um, being so overtaken by the connection with the divine, and and how Bernini and the Baroque approach to it is in some ways more dramatic, um, more sensual, but also a little bit more literal, whereas Bellini's is much more using some some subtle ideas like using the geometry of the page to represent the uh, the force of of the divine connection whereas Bernini uses an actual arrow um, what else do we want to talk about um, I guess the other thing that I would um, reiterate since from the time we first talked about it is that this piece is part of um, a setting it's like 
Bernini not only made this piece, but he designed the whole space that it went into. And in some ways, you have to think about all of that, the niche area in the church as part of um, his composition. Okay, and I think that brings us to number 30, which will be the last one we'll talk about in this first part. This is Caravaggio. Um, and let's see, what are some of the things that we talked about with Caravaggio? Well, once again, it's a, an oil painting. Uh, once again, this is a Baroque painting. Uh, Caravaggio is very early Baroque. If you remember, we talked about how um, the very early Baroque, you know, 1600 to about 1610, 1612, uh, was defined by the rivalry between two great painters, uh, Caravaggio and Caracci. And Caracci was seen as the, the classicist, uh, much more an idealist who worked at idealizing narratives and figures. And Caravaggio was different. Uh, one of the things that was different about his painting was that he used everyday people as models and then he painted them in a very kind of everyday way. He really looked at um, the dirt on their feet, so to speak, and looked at the veins um, on their calf or on their uh, hands. And he really um, thought about the wrinkles on their skin. Um, and also, um, Caravaggio, another thing that we talked about with Caravaggio was the development of this sort of extreme form of chiaroscuro, uh, which we call tenebrism, um, where the space that the figure's in is extremely dark and then they're illuminated by strong lighting, um, just kind of emerging out of the darkness. And another thing that you could talk about in this painting is the subject matter. We talked about how um, there were lots of different themes, like the descent of the cross, uh, the entombment of Christ, the deposition, the lamentation, these are all themes that are about different kind of stages of this end period um, just after Christ's death. And um, and how important the distinction between these themes was for Renaissance and Baroque artists and patrons. Um, another thing we, you could talk about with this composition is the strong diagonal movement, right? This, um, where it's not just a strong diagonal, but it's like the sense of a succession of like diagonals falling down. So we almost feel the movement of him being laid down. Um, it's really quite brilliant. So it's a beautiful painting. Um, it's a great example of Caravaggio and his influence and why, what he set in terms of a, as a standard for, um, for later Baroque painting. Okay, I'm going to end there, and when I come back, I'll talk about uh, Rubens, uh, because it's a good example. Uh, all right, for part